Hi everyone, welcome back. I'm Michael Sandler, your host on Inspire Nation. If you've ever wanted to get unstuck, move past depression, or achieve great things like the ancients and the gods, then do we have the Miracle Club show for you. Today I'll be talking with Mitch Horowitz, a leader in the New Thought Movement, Penn Award-winning historian, the author of Occult America and One Simple Idea, and the author of a must-read book that just keeps getting better and better over time, The Miracle Club. And that's just what I want to talk with him about today, about awakening your mental giant slumbering within. That, plus we'll talk about think and grow rich, getting unstuck, depression in the new age, the symbolic power of the ancients, and what in the world November 23rd has to do with anything. <laughs> gotcha. So welcome back to the show, Mitch. Are you ready to shine? Yes, thank you. Great to be here. Great to I have I love the you. Egyptian motif. Excellent, excellent. So where on that note did you just come back from? I just came back from Egypt, from Mother Egypt. I'm back here in New York City, maybe less than 48 hours. Uh, I got off a flight not long ago at JFK. It was quite an amazing trip. I was there with my friend Ronnie Thomas, who is the director of a new film that I'm working on, which is a documentary movie about the great occult book, The Kabbalion. Yeah. And we felt we didn't want to just talk about The Kabbalion in front of a green screen of Egyptian monuments, but we wanted to go to the the metaphysical heartland itself, the cradle of civilization itself. And we spent about a week in Egypt uh, filming, interviewing people, uh, refining some of our ideas. We visited uh, Luxor, uh, the Giza Plateau, as, as, as pictured behind you, uh, several temples at Luxor, temples at Memphis, and a, a variety of other historic sites, spent some time on the Nile. And it was just a, an extraordinary trip and uh, made our movie all the richer. We're going to be completing this documentary on the Kabbalion between now and probably uh, late fall of this year, and you can watch for it the middle of next year. Awesome. And and so I was saving the Kabbalion for the end, but but let's go there briefly. Sorry, I've ruined the show. <laughs> <laughs> Anything but you actually <laughs> helped guide us. What does... What do the precepts of of e ancient Egypt have to do with the Kabbalion? And what did you learn specifically in Egypt about the Kabbalion? Well, the Kabbalion is a tricky book because it was written in uh, 1908. And at first, when I read the book myself about 20 years ago, I really thought of it as just a novelty of early 20th century occultism. I thought it was your basic new thought or positive mind philosophy kind of dramatized and dressed up in ancient Egyptian garb. But a few years ago, I came to a whole new appreciation of the book, and I came to feel that the book is a, a great deal more than that, and that I, like many people, underestimated it. It is a retention, the Kabbalion, of certain late ancient Greek-Egyptian ideas. Uh, to some extent, these ideas are dramatized. Uh, to some extent, these ideas are augmented with early 20th century thought, including the precepts of new thought and the new American metaphysics. But to a very great degree, there are ideas in that book that are echoes of authentic hermetic ideas from the city of Alexandria in the decades immediately following the death of Christ, where you had a kind of melding of Egyptian and Greek culture. And... Some of the precepts and tenets of the book are really, you know, they sound to us uh, like iterations of modern new thought, but they have their earliest roots. They have their earliest roots in late Egyptian thought. And as such, the Kabbalion is a very precious thread to antiquity. And the trip to Egypt helped confirm that for us. Can you share with us one or two precepts from it? Oh, sure. Uh, one of the core ideas in the Kabbalion is that life is composed of these sliding scales of polarity. There's no absolute good or absolute evil, uh, just as there's no absolute hot and absolute cold, but everything is part of a sliding scale that tends to rhythmically slide back and forth. And you'll see, for example, encrypted within any number of Egyptian monuments and base reliefs, this idea of uniting polarities. Uh, I came across one base relief that I was very touched by, which you'll see in the movie, which shows 
the god Set, who is sometimes thought of as the god of the underworld, being united with Horus, his nephew, who is sometimes seen as the god of life. And these two are sometimes depicted as enemies in myth, and yet they are uh, dramatized, demonstrated as two opposite polarities, two necessary complements that are being and can be uh, drawn together. And when we're able to avoid this persistent sliding back and forth between ex between extremes, psychologically speaking, we might experience that as mood swings, as I do, as many people of an artistic temperament do. Um, when we can avoid that sliding scale of extremes, we can strengthen our concentration, our causative abilities, the creative abilities and potentials of our mind. So that's a central tenet of the Kabbalion, and you'll see that encrypted within symbology in ancient Egyptian monuments. Beautiful. And we, we may double back toward the end here. Sure. Happy Going to. Back to Egypt. And, and this is, it's a goal of mine to get over there in the next few years. And, and first, I want to check out all the symbology because the language of symbols, if I understand correct, Egyptians, the Egyptian people may have had a different way of thinking yes. because they may have thought more picturally, more symbolically yeah. than we do today. Yeah, and that's a very important point. And when I talk about Hermetic literature, I'm making a reference to the god Hermes, which is, of course, a Greek name, but the Greeks associated their god Hermes with the Egyptian god of intellect and wisdom, Thoth. And they referred to Thoth as thrice greatest Hermes, or three times great Hermes. And that's the, um, that's the antecedent for the term Hermetic, uh, which refers to this way of thought that grew out of late ancient Egyptian Greek culture. Now, the Egyptians, as you were saying, they had a symbolist language, and the Greeks had a more expository literary language. So in the final generations of what we would consider to be ancient Egyptian culture, the Greeks began writing down certain Egyptian precepts and religious ideas, which may have been passed on through oral tradition, which may have been passed on through symbolism, but which the Greeks codified into a very expository written language. So that hermetic literature, that late ancient Greek-Egyptian literature, is extremely valuable because it's one of the very few pieces of literary exposition that we have of ancient Egyptian philosophy. And that's what shows up in the Kabbalion. So it's a very precious thread to Egyptian antiquity. Thank you. On, on that note, this is, this is going to take some major extrapolation here, but I want, I want your best opinion. If they were, not if, there, there was a society, and there may have been many before that, thinking pictorially, yeah. how did their way of thinking, do you think, affect everything or specific their worldview? And maybe it's best to compare their worldview then than how we think now and our worldview today? Well, that's a wonderful question, and it's, it's very, very difficult to answer because it would really <clears throat> require getting into the psyche of people who existed thousands upon thousands of years ago, and it's difficult, I think, for us to be able to do that, although certainly we can look at ancient cultures and we can see, in some cases, we had similar concepts of the endurance of beauty. We had similar concepts of things which held us in a sense of awe for the Egyptians, the sun and the cosmos and the, the lunar calendar. And these things were all great cosmic workings that I think have inspired awe across all civilizations. And they detected great meaning in these things, whereas sometimes today we're prone just to detect movement in them. But it's it's very, very difficult to try to imagine oneself in the position of a person or a civilization that possessed such a deep symbolical uh, psyche. But I do think one idea that has been encoded in Hermetic philosophy that probably stretches back eons into the depths of Egyptian civilization is the 
the famous principle, as above, so below, as above, so below. The Egyptians pictured everything as a being part of a, a kind of concentric circle of creation so that if you could know the particle, you could know the macro, you could know the whole. And I think in the 21st century, both in our science and our philosophy and our religious point of view, we're coming back around to that very ancient expression. Thank you. It's, it's something I work with my coaching clients, and I call myself, <clears throat> I, I'm teaching them alchemy. I call myself yes. an alchemist, meaning mm-hmm. I take more time each day going to what I call the other side of the veil, working yeah. with the written word on the other side than I do actually moving physical chess pieces around because I believe that's where the real work is done and then that's reflected down in this world. Yes, yes I think that's wonderful. I think that's wonderful. And, you know, one of the chief principles that existed within Hermeticism and that has been very important to me as I was writing The Miracle Club and other things is this idea that if you take seriously this principle of as above, so below, or as it got rendered into scripture, God created man in his own image. I mean, that's just really a different way of saying the same thing. If you take that principle seriously, then it stands to reason that we too are creators within our own physical framework, within our own cosmic framework. So if one accepts that there's some higher source of creation in whose image we are fashioned, however you want to regard that, uh, or if it at least stands to reason that the uh, cycles of the atom represent and mirror the cycles of the cosmos, then so do we, and that we are intended to be creators. We are intended to be generative. We are intended to be expansive. And we do so within the framework in which we function. And the Kabbalion was very clarifying to me about that because you know, it's easy to look at concepts of a law of attraction and get perplexed because, of course, if we accept that we live under one mental super law, we also bump into apparent contradictions, like we die, our bodies wither, our bodies decay. There's never been an exception to that. And and yet, if one reads into hermetic philosophy, including the Kabbalion, you find an answer to that contradiction, which is that, yes, we are creators, but we are not the same thing as creation. The branch is not the same thing exactly as the tree or exactly as the roots of the tree. It's intimately related to those roots, but it has to function according to its own laws. And so do we. So within this cosmic framework, we face certain laws of physical limitation, for example. That doesn't mean we're not creators. It just means that we're related to the whole. We're not exactly the whole. And we may not have the ability to rewrite the whole. Right, right. Uh, the, the wish is that we expand, that we grow, that we gravitate towards that great center to which we're intimately related. But we're not exactly the same thing. Just as the root and the branch, they're intimately related, but they're not precisely the same thing. So I'm going to ask, just because, <clears throat> in, in a sense, <laughs> you're a well-advanced very advanced version of a doppelganger of me. And you have uh-huh. gone over to Egypt, and I haven't done that yet. So I'm going to ask you two questions that are fairly out there, and then we're going to double back around. But since yeah. you said they're related but not exactly the same thing, question number one, do you believe Egypt, ancient Egypt, was too advanced to be just built by the Egyptians based on your experience there? Well, that's a wonderful question. That's a very heavy political question, actually, because the Egyptians themselves are very sensitive to that question. Yes. And they feel that when Western New Asians like me come over, ready to expound on theories of Atlantis and alien civilizations and so on, it's insulting to them because they feel that that's their national heritage that's being compromised. I would say that ancient Egypt, just as the Native American culture here on our own continent, was profoundly advanced in ways that we can't understand, had a deeper knowledge of nature that we can understand. And I don't think, even if one entertains theories of there being a timeline of ancient Egypt that's much, much older than the traditional timeline, and I take that concept very, very seriously, the independent Egyptologists, John Anthony West and Robert Schock, uh, West was a friend. Uh, Shock has been a friend. I haven't been in touch with him for years. But I take seriously 
their theories that the oldest portions of the Sphinx suggest water damage that would reset the timeline to a, a, a much earlier place. None of that, none of that requires depriving the Egyptian people, depriving the ancient Egyptian people of their place as progenitors of civilization. To say that the timeline is older than what we know, um, or to say that there is a civilization that's older than what we have taken account of, according to the uh, traditional order of things, doesn't mean that those people were not there in northern Africa, that our ancient forebearers and that the gatekeepers of civilization were not ancient Egyptian. Of course, indeed, they were. Um, now, as far as the ancient astronaut theory and that kind of thing, it's not something I've ever uh, studied. I, I don't have any opinion about it. But I, I, I think that none of these explorations make it necessary to deprive the Egyptian people themselves of their place as the progenitors of civilization. It just might be older than we have understood. Very, very, very well put. We'll leave that alone for now. And I want to talk about, A, what you found most interesting, and B, this kind of goes along the same line, I'm guessing you're sensitive to energy as well, or at least you want to feel things out. What felt the most interesting to you? Uh, I had the opportunity <clears throat> to meditate in a temple to the god uh, Sekhmet, who is uh, uh, the goddess of, of power, who was kind of the right hand of Osiris in exercising power. W which is and interesting. I got to pause you because you have a thing for power. You have written you. about power. Yes. yes. Uh, this is an area that some people feel borders on the heretical, but my spiritual search is a search for power. And I think truly, if we're not embarrassed by those terms, all of us are engaged in that search, whether it's thy will be done or whether it's my will be done. We are looking for ways to open ourselves up as vessels of power. Some people will say truth. I say power. I think truly and, and in my heart, without any self-censorship, that's my search. That's what I'm engaged in. I think that's true of all of us. It's certainly true of me. So some guides told me that if you go to the vast temple complex at uh, Luxor, the Temple of Karnak specifically, you will find off the beaten path, quite literally, a locked temple to Sekhmet. And outside this locked temple are a soldier with an automatic machine gun and um, basically a guide, a robed guide who works probably for the Ministry of Antiquities. And it's locked. Uh, no one is allowed in, and um, um, money makes the world go round, <laughs> whether we like it or not. And you have to pay these guys, the soldier and the guide, and it's uh, and they will they will let you in if they're in a good mood and they like the looks of you. And by liking the looks of you, you should probably approach with a certain degree of humility and honor. Uh, so Ronnie and I were led to this rather isolated area of the Temple of Karnak, and we did pay the soldier and the guide to allow us in. And um, I said a very special and very deep prayer to Sekhmet, and that was very, very meaningful to me. Uh, it felt powerful, it felt good, it felt right. Um, I also was in a very isolated uh, part of a, a, a burial chamber at the temple, um, at a temple at the Valley of the Kings, and which is also in Luxor. And um, I was able to touch a base relief of a ceremonial bull, which was very meaningful to me. And the god Set, who is sometimes thought of as the god of the underworld, but who perhaps more accurately could be described as the god of storms and the god of the desert. Um, I saw very rare and uncommon uh, etchings and carvings of, of Set, which were extremely important to me. And so getting in touch with those deities was extremely meaningful to me. That was probably the most meaningful part of the trip. I can't help it. we got to just keep diving down and diving down here. And if we get nowhere else today, this will be the most fascinating interview. Oh, may I add one addendum, if Please. you don't mind? Um, this is something very important because 
you know, there tends to be, I think, this unnecessary division between the mainstream folk and the New Age folk about the so-called purpose of the pyramids. And the way that this false binary division is framed very often is that the mainstream folk will say, the pyramids were nothing but burial chambers. Nothing but is a favorite expression. Um, And the New Age folk will say, uh, the pyramids were anything but burial chambers. You know, they were power plants and they were coordinates for you know, ancient astronauts and they were, they were, they were chambers of, of power and initiation and realization. I want to say that, you know, having been inside the King's chamber and, and my friend Ronnie got to enter uh, the sarcophagus, which I did not, but having been inside the King's chamber and witnessing the sarcophagus, I had, um, a notion that similarly came to me when I was touring certain so-called burial chambers um, in Britain, uh, specifically at Avebury and other areas surrounding Stonehenge. Um, we get, you know, you were you were making reference earlier to trying to understand the psyche of a culture that thought and existed within symbolic terms, yeah. and how difficult that is for us because. We're always trying to superimpose our 21st century point of view on ancient folk and saying, well, it was like this or it was like that. Whereas I think the truth is it wasn't like anything that we hold from our contemporary viewpoints. When we speak in terms of burial chambers, we have a very binary one-sided point of view as a burial chamber being a cemetery or a mausoleum or a place of internment. Whereas I think for the ancient people of Egypt and of Europe, for that matter, referencing Avebury and Stonehenge, I don't think they had that same binary perspective on life and death. And the dead were as much part of their reality, their familial system, their point of view, their vision of life, their vision of the whole, as the so-called living were. And that it was insufficient to say, well, this is a burial chamber where death goes on and somewhere out there in the marketplace is a bazaar where life goes on. The two things were interrelated and intimate in ways that I don't think we appreciate from a 21st century perspective. So the fact that a sarcophagus was present somewhere or the fact that elders were buried somewhere in the caves of Avebury, for example, in, in the British Isles, doesn't mean that the uses and the significance of those places were limited to our 21st century conceptions of what that means. There was a community, a confluence, a flow between life and death that's different from that which we possess. And you could have something that functioned for the dead and also functioned for the living. And there was a great whole going on, not just a divided polarity, you know, as I was saying before. And, you know, it's entirely possible that the pyramids served a vast number of purposes. Obviously, internment and burial was one, and initiation, religious significance, the probing of other realities was another. It's not either or. And one of the flaws with which we 21st century people address history is we feel almost with this brutal certainty that history has to conform to our categories. I think that this division between the new age perspective and the mainstream perspective is it's a false division. I don't, it, it's us projecting our own uh, concepts and perspectives backwards thousands of years to a culture that had a vastly different and broader, I think, perspective on nature than we do. There wasn't this division between the living and the dead. Thanks. And so these things served a, a, a universal purpose that I don't think we, we grasp when we say it must be this or it must be that. And, and, and it is both, I think, how you live, how what you are studying. And if a name popped into my head, because I believe we are slowly, maybe it's on an accelerator, heading in that direction. I look at somebody like a Dean Radin who's showing how, <laughs> showing the science that it's not this black or white. There's not its science right. or its spirituality. You can't get right. away from both. It's a doorway. Right. It's a doorway. And we're coming to a broader perspective on, on, on life, on death, all across our, our 
culture. We're coming to a broader perspective. This, uh, we get into this similar trap today when people try to create this false debate, I think, over whether intelligence or consciousness is localized. Well, of course, you know, there's an interplay between our physical selves and the outer world. But apropos of Dean's work and that of others, we have so much evidence for non-localized intelligence that to deny it would be the equivalent of refusing to look through Galileo's telescope. That doesn't mean a brain doesn't also need to be present. You know, we, one of the fissures of human nature is that we think it, it must be this or it must be that, and it's not necessarily a binary. Thank you. So going back to the Valley of Kings and this relief that you touched, and you said it was very important to you. Yeah, yeah. Tell me more. This was a, 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 this was a base relief of a bull, mm -hmm. and um, a guide down there uh, sort of directed me to touch it. Uh, and I, I don't want to sound idealistic about all this stuff, because everybody who wants to show you something special also wants to be paid. Uh, money makes the world go round, and commerce is never far away in ancient Egypt any more than it is in New York City. Um, but I was directed to touch this bull, and I felt, what can I say, Michael? I, I closed my eyes, and I felt this, this beautiful charge of yellow electricity and lightning go through me. I call it whatever you will. It was an experience. It was an experience. I wish it for everybody. It was absolutely magnificent. And the depth and the value of that experience will be proven or disproven uh, in the months and years ahead of my life. We can come back and analyze this. <laughs> well, it, it, it almost has tears flowing in me. That means we've hit some sort of a truth. And it's a question I have for you that you're not, you're not far enough out of the bubble to know. But I know if I pictured gears turning inside of you, this trip, <laughs> something went... <laughs> Kadunk. I think so. I think so. Uh, it was a wonderful trip. I also want to say that it was a tough trip, too, in some ways, because the fact is, I love Egypt and I love the Egyptian people. There's also a great deal of poverty there. And I have walked through um, developing cultures. I have walked through poor uh, cities and poor cultures. And um, this one was particularly tough. The street scenes outside the monuments um, are marked by a great deal of poverty. Uh, and people, you know, when they see a European face or an American face, uh, they, they come at you and they will sometimes come at you physically. I mean, I had people, you know, touching me in ways that were very invasive. And, um, you know, a kid tried to take a bracelet off my hand. Um, somebody tried to take my scarf, you know, from me. And, you know. You, you, you do feel physically invaded, and I, I uh, n not by everybody, not by everybody, but I, I, I have to say I'd be, I'd be uh, committing uh, self-censorship or, or a sin of omission if I didn't say that because we weren't part of your standard tour package, uh, it was also very, very challenging and at times physically intimidating and exhausting to be in a situation where – you know, I'm a person from a, a very wealthy first world culture encountering folk who, and I'm, I'm not insensitive to it, who live in a culture that has been marked and marred by poverty, some of which is a legacy of colonialism that comes from the very part of the world that I comfortably live in. And there were times where it could be physically challenging, physically intimidating, and it was tough. It was tough. And we chose to do it that way. We chose not to go with a standard tour package, although you have to almost certainly have to have a guide when you go to the monuments because it's, it's very hard to navigate them without such a guide. Uh, and so physically uh, and emotionally, um, it can also be exhausting and it can be tough. And I say that with a deep love for Egypt and the Egyptian people. And, and I'm nodding my head because the closest I've come is, is an, an unguided trip through Morocco many years yeah, ago. Yeah, imagine that's similar, yeah. And yeah. and like going into the Medina, this ancient part of the city that's 5,000, yeah. if not many more thousand years of age. And yes. everybody understandably wants something from you because what you yes. have as a day's wage is a year or, right. or a decade. Of Absolutely theirs. true. Absolutely true. It's very hard for us to uh, grasp the scale of difference in wealth between 
Western Europe, North America, and you know, North Africa. And it's, it's very, very serious. So one just has to be prepared for that. And um, if one can't deal with those contradictions, you're going on the wrong trip. But if you can deal with it, you're going to be in for a little bit of emotional and physical exhaustion. But you also you have to be educated about this. Thank you. So let's go from there. We might double back to Egypt because I don't think I can get enough of it. However, I wanted to talk today about awakening the mental giant slumbering within. Uh huh. <laughs> all right. I'm what, all for it. <laughs> what can you tell us about Anthony Norville? And since so many people are struggling there, so many people are struggling listening to the show, how do we move past a tendency to minimize ourselves? Oh, that's wonderful. That's wonderful. Anthony Norville was a popular writer in the occult uh, and various mystical topics. And um, he lived and worked from the 1950s through the 1980s. Uh, and he wrote a book, a very good book, that has been underappreciated called The Million Dollar Secret Hidden in Your Mind. And he, he had a gift for a turn of a phrase. He had a gift for attractive magnetic titles. And when I first read this book, I thought, oh boy, this is just gonna be some piece of metaphysical salesmanship. But to my pleasant surprise, I highly recommend the book. I've done an abridgment of it. There's other recordings available of it out there. There's, there's physical and digital versions of it available. It really is a very thoughtful, heartfelt book about using your mental prowess, using your untapped mental powers to guide yourself into a new kind of existence. And he hits upon a lot of things that I think are quite noble and good in the book. One of the things he talks about is, and I think a lot of your listeners and, and viewers will relate to this, it's the important of, importance of not getting caught up in relationships and expectations that belong to the old neighborhood, so to speak. And he talks about how people you grew up with, family members, friends, even workmates from your earliest jobs, may be people who actually bring out the very worst habits in you, who bring out um, the worst traits of competitiveness, the worst insecurities, uh, the worst kinds of hostilities or prejudices. And he talks about the importance of really being willing to make a clean break with your past. And that's something that I endorse. And I've always wholeheartedly endorsed. I, I, I think it's very, very important. And in fact, one of the great gifts that we've been given in the first world, which I think a lot of people envy and which we overlook, is that there is this capacity to remake yourself beyond the economic and familial ties of your background. And that's one of the things that Norvell talks about in The Million Dollar Secret. And I think he did that. And, and I think probably a lot of people who watch shows like yours are very attuned to that and very sensitive to that. And I, I do believe that, and I think our brothers and sisters in the developing world often don't have this opportunity, and we owe it to ourselves to appreciate this opportunity within our own lives. We do have mobility, geographically, economically, and even in terms of how we define ourselves. I mean, I think that Everything that's going on with transgender politics today is wonderful because it gives people a language to define themselves that maybe wasn't possessed by an earlier generation. And we should treasure these things and value them and use them. And I want to say that um, yeah, I, I address this directly to the viewer, to the listener. If you feel you're in a situation where you agonize over family holidays, Thanksgiving, Christmas, Passover, whatever it is, and you feel that uh, that your family lays heat on you that's unfair or that your so-called friends do that or your coworkers do that, you must remember that you are possessed of the ability both within and without to chart a completely new path. And there's so much power in that. There's so much power in that. Never neglect it. Never neglect it. Thank you. Thank you. And we're going to go yeah. from there and talk about the subconscious mind in a second. I just had a hit and you, you it's completely off topic or yes. on, to uh, on topic. I, <laughs> I tripped across a book. I think it was a coaching client who, who turned me on to it a few weeks ago. I haven't gotten a hold of it yet, but I said, if anybody can point me in the direct, the right <laughs> direction, it's Mitch, the red book by Carl Jung. Oh, well, I have to tell you, I have not read the Red Book yet, 
And I know it's been out there in the culture for a few years now. Um, I do think uh, it's, 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 it's quite evident that there's a, a revolution in young studies going on. I realize that there are now popular editions coming out of the notebooks in which Jung first constructed what we call the Red Book. And I've been told by people whose opinions I really respect that as these notebooks come out, we're going to have a whole revolutionized view of Jung. But I'm just a bystander. You know, I have not read the Red Book yet. There is a, 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 an edition published in a smaller trim size that I very deeply want to read and intend to read. There was a scholar named Lance Morrow, who I had the opportunity to spend some time with at Rice University last spring, where there was a conference on American spirituality and Gnosticism. And Lance, I think he's probably today's greatest independent scholar on Jung. And if you put his name into Google with Jung's, you'll find his website, which I think is called Lumen. And Lance has written some very important, accessible, but, but deeply esoteric uh, expository essays on Jung. And for people who want to get into the Red Book, uh, I recommend starting there. Lance my getting to know Lance was sort of a starting point for me, which I now have to follow up on. Uh, excellent. And you know my gears are turning as to, let's get Lance on the show ASAP. Oh, he's a trip. He's an encyclopedia. Awesome. Subconscious is so important. That's, a, mm -hmm. that's, a, that's such a, such a almost silly statement. It's running the show. One it's running the, the show, yeah. One of the things from Norval, mm -hmm. your subconscious mind will give you valuable ideas. But if you do not write them down, they leave suddenly, and it's difficult to recall them again. Yes, yes. It's profoundly important when these flashes of inspiration, call them whatever you will, appear in the mind. It's profoundly important to act on these things in some way, whether writing them down or whether doing the thing immediately that you're impelled to do. I have written some of my finest essays, some of my very, very finest essays, in the impulse of a moment. And I know that for some people, work or, or, or household obligations make it impossible to just drop everything and do that. But if you can't drop everything and do that, and I understand that, uh, take down some notes quickly. Don't lose that golden thread. Um, David Lynch was saying that there was a book that deeply inspired him um, oh, it was by a, a French American painter. He lived in New York here for a while. It was called the artistic life. The name is escaping me. It was, um, Henri something anyway, forgive me because it's escaping me. But Lynch was saying that the, the, the center point of this book, the center point of the artistic life is that you have to have a setup readily at hand, whether you're a painter, writer, filmmaker, or a financier, whatever you are, you have to have your workshop, your studio, whatever it is, set up and ready to go. Because when you get one of these flashes of inspiration from the subconscious or whatever you want to call it, you must act on it. You must act on it. And Lynch said that he realized when he was very young that it was vitally important to him to have uh, a kind of setup at the ready. Um, I think Robert Henry, Robert Henry is the author of the book I'm, I'm referencing, The Artistic Life, but forgive me if I'm incorrect. It won't be too difficult to find in this digital age. Anyway, Lynch was saying that at his house, he has a studio set up with canvases and paints, and he's ready to roll if an idea comes to him. And he said, you know, it does sometimes mean sacrificing other things, and it does sometimes mean blowing it in other areas of life. But the essence of the artistic life, as he sees it, and as and it was as 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 Robert Andre uh, uh, Henri articulated it, is the necessity of having your setup, your paints, your pad, your notebook, whatever it is, at the ready, so that you can act. And I found that to be true. I have an article coming out from the website Medium.com uh, tomorrow, which is which is Friday the eighth. Um, it'll be up there once this show is, is airing, and it's called How Tucker Carlson Saved My Life. And it's about how the conservative commentator Tucker Carlson, who used to be a friend of mine, um, basically got me to stop uh, drinking and smoking pot. Uh, things I really enjoy, by the way, but things which were creating a drag on my life, so I stopped. And um, I had the flash of instinct to write this article all of a sudden. I was sitting in my apartment, 
And I realized that, first of all, I had gone through this kind of personal revelation where I realized that booze and pot were becoming a detriment to me. And I really enjoy booze and pot. I mean, don't get me wrong. I'm not puritanical. And if you can do it and it doesn't mess you up, God love you. But it was messing me up, I thought. It wasn't it wasn't putting me off track, but it was placing a drag on my productivity. Mm -hmm. And I thought, I, I got to move on from this. And there was something Tucker said that really inspired me. So I sat down and I banged out this essay, How Tucker Carlson Saved My Life. And uh, it'll be up on Medium by the time uh, folks are watching this. And I'm, I'm pleased with the essay. It's very honest. It's very frank. It's very straightforward. I hope it'll lead other people maybe in a similar direction that I was led. Um, and I wrote it all of a sudden, I wrote it all of a sudden, if I had waited a day, it wouldn't have come out the same way. It wouldn't have been as powerful. It wouldn't have been as honest. And I just banged it out. And so I guess this is my way of responding to your question, which is that when these flashes come to you, act on them. If you can't act on them in terms of sitting down and writing the piece that you want because there are other obligations that take you away from it, take some notes, take some notes and come back to it. It's certainly the next best thing, but act. Don't just say, gee, that's interesting, act. It's interesting, I've been working with a um, coaching client of mine recently who's a, a very good artist. I'm talking and, and he has in his studio all these pieces that have not been finished because he stepped away yes, from the energy. Yes, I've heard of that. Yes, yes, I've heard of that, I've heard of that, yeah. You must not step away. You have to take breaks sometimes because your mind and body can only do so much. And also, uh, there's a counterpart to this too, and I would caution people about this. Don't – the very fact of having your studio or your, your writing materials or whatever set up is very important. But don't get carried away with it to the point where you isolate yourself either because I Thank think you. one thing that can be very damaging to people is that people who want to write, for example, have this – romantic image of having the so-called cabin in the woods where you can write. I don't necessarily advise that because I have friends who have gone to write at the cabin in the woods. And quite frankly, I say this with great love. They kind of go crazy. You know, they start drinking or they relapse Here's into alcoholism. Johnny. <laughs> right. Exactly. Thank you. Exactly. And anybody who doesn't know that reference, watch The Shining tonight. That is exactly what happens because the truth is as a writer, I can say this with absolute confidence, and you'll, you'll, you'll see other writers make reference to this. You only really have about mm, maybe three hours of quality time in you a day as a writer. You might have a couple of hours when you wake up in the morning. You might have another hour later in the day. And that doesn't mean you can't do other productive things. You could be reading, researching, taking notes, doing all kinds of things. You can also be taking a break, which is necessary. But people who rent the so-called cabin in the woods, here's Johnny, um, they sometimes are not in touch with that tough truth. And you wake up at eight o'clock in the morning, whatever, ready to go, you have your coffee, you sit down, you write your morning pages, and then maybe you go into your project. You know, you're kind of spent by about 11 a.m. And you've got a long stretch of day in front of you. And it may be winter. And what are you going to do the rest of the day? You better have a plan. Are you fixing something? Are you repairing a car? Um, maybe it's, it's actually not such a great idea to be isolated and be alone because I know a lot of people who have done that to themselves and they get hooked on, on, on junk or on booze or something because they're very lonely and they're very bored. And isolating yourself is not the same thing as having your studio or your materials at the ready. And the pressures of a day job or the pressures of economics or the pressures of you know, taking care of the kids or whatever, that can be the very thing that saves your life because artists only have so much in them, just like everybody else. It's not like an athlete can work out all day. He or she may work out quite a bit, but come three o'clock, it's like, okay, I got to zone out here or do something else. So it's not, you, you don't want to prescribe a recipe for isolation either. If there's a theme I hear coming out in your show today, it's don't be binary. Don't think it's got to be this way or that way. The, the day job that, that the artist finds to be a drag could be the thing that's saving his or her life. Because let me tell you, that cabin in the Maine woods, that ain't just the setting for Stephen King novels. You can go nuts. And I've had friends to whom it's happened. And people who haven't spent time writing, for example, might not realize before the fact that they only have about 
maybe three hours a day in them of quality writing, and then it can get very boring and lonely. So uh, don't isolate yourself. Be really careful. Thank you. And, and, and not only can that day job be uh, your investor in your future, so to speak, but I like the phrase, give something to a busy person. Having that anchor Absolutely in true. your yeah. day can actually yeah. bring it all into focus. Absolutely true. And boy, do you value your free time or your creative time, rather, when it comes, because you know what it's like not to have it. So it, it, the existence of attention, uh, the existence of attention can be quite good. So, so let's go from there and let's talk about, first I'm going to talk about it briefly with Norval, and then I want to jump in real quickly to uh, Napoleon Hill and Think and Grow Rich. Please. I keep coming up with, it keeps hitting in my head, I keep working with coaching client after client off this, five-year plan. And from Norval, your mind likes definiteness. Yeah. Give yourself yes. a five-year right. plan for right. study, growth, right. and involvement. I love that word, involvement. Yeah. Uh, yeah, he points that out, and I think he's he's quite correct. Uh, the mind enjoys definiteness, uh, and it's 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 frankly fun in a certain way to project. All right, you know, what am I going to do? What's going to be my plan? Even if it changes, and it will almost certainly change because that's just the way life is. But you can accomplish quite a bit, and quite a bit more than you think if you map out a plan for yourself. The mind does like definiteness; it's reassured by definiteness. And I frankly think definiteness is necessary. I, I, my approach has never been one of drifting. Uh, some people do take an approach of drifting. Uh, some people have written to me and say, listen, I've been successful in all these areas of my life, and I'm just a guy who drifts. And it's like, well, you know, Henry David Thoreau spent five years in the woods. You know, I mean, he did actually plan things out as beautifully as he gave his day over to the cycles of nature. He also did map out a plan, so don't be afraid of a plan. Again, you know, we're coming to the theme of the show, which is it's not an either or. Mapping out a five year plan doesn't mean you can't be Thoreau. Thoreau spent five years in the woods. You know, somewhere along the line, he mapped out, okay, this is pretty much what I'm thinking. And I think that, that, that the existence of a plan and the existence of finding the space within that plan can be a kind of golden ticket. Thank you. So I want to dive into Think and Grow Rich, and and this is kind of that tension as well. So I'm going to give a personal example from your life, committing to a deadline with a specific dollar amount. There's a sticky note in your, yeah. your probably your first copy, which also that's right. didn't go, and that's why I, I joked about November 23rd, didn't go quite <laughs> according to plan, but you allowed the wiggle room. Yeah. I, I was reading Think and Grow Rich with deep seriousness in the year 2013, and I, uh, I always ran into a kind of internal barrier when I came to the instruction that Napoleon Hill put in the book of committing to a certain dollar amount that you're going to earn by a certain date. I never wanted to do that. It seemed gauche. It seemed materialistic. It didn't seem spiritual to me. But back in 2013, when I, I made a dedicated, concentrated reading of the book, which I've been doing ever since, I said to myself, this time out, I'm going to do it the way the man says. I'm going to give Napoleon Hill his due, yeah. and I'm going to follow his instructions to the T. It's just an experiment. So I wrote down a dollar amount. I wrote down this dollar amount coming to me at a certain date. And then later on, uh, I had actually forgotten about writing down the dollar amount. I was combing back through the book. And I found the dollar amount and the date and discovered to my astonishment a, a great deal of congruity between an unlikely and large sum of money that had come to me through my work and that very date in the book by which it came to me, which was my, my birthday, November 23rd, uh, apropos of your reference. And I was really shocked because I, I believe basically in repeating this story that subconsciously this number had been fixed in my mind and that there was a kind of almost a homing device at work that that drew me toward it or it toward me. And I, I, I've ever since placed great stock in this idea, even though people may feel resistance to it. So that, that takes me in a complete tangent in a most beautiful direction. Um, I think it was a client I was talking with earlier today about was thinking about somebody and somebody called or had been thinking about something else and it had already taken place. The idea of inception 
where did it come from? Where's the starting point? Did that yeah. dollar amount already take place that you said, and then draw you forth toward it? Isn't that wonderful? What a wonderful question. Because one of the things I talk about in the Miracle Club, and we'll go into this in another show, is that linearity is an illusion. And Thank I think you. that there's a great deal of, of evidence for that statement, which I which I explore in the book and which you and I can explore in a future show. Um, Done. We're, 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 we're non-binary and we're non-linear. And uh, uh, I think that that there's an illusory nature to linearity. And sometimes you can grasp a personal glimpse or experience of this when you think about a chain of events and you find that it's very uh, tantalizingly and almost delightfully elusive to pinpoint a starting point. And, and it's quite wonderful when you experience this. I mean, I've thought of people and relationships and things that have come to me in life. And I think, wow, they came to me because maybe somebody said no to me and I was forced to explore other resources. Uh, they came to me because of a, a particular book that I read that later maybe I even disagreed with and I came to feel was the wrong kind of influence. But the book itself brought me into contact with people who's, 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 who became formative uh, influences in my life. And it's, it's difficult to tell when you start to unravel this this ball of twine, whether there's actually any center to it. It, it, it seems like a ball of twine without a center, without a middle. It, it, it perhaps was all there, and we just needed to enter it at some point. And everything that we decide was, was past, present, or future existed in one greater whole. Does it give you greater, for lack of another word, confidence, knowing that there's some greater mechanism, strings connected. It's, it's continuously moving and changing and morphing. But if you let go, it's still going to unfold. You don't have yes. to worry this piece. Okay. Yeah, absolutely. There, there does seem to be some self-propelling engine, for lack of a better word, some dynamo of life, some dynamic that goes whether or not I'm kind of tugging at the string or not. And it's so funny because I can think of people in life who I have resented, people who I thought were lazy or didn't or broke their word to me or something, and I resented them. Yeah. But if I look at it from a different perspective, I can see who that person that I might have resented because of their fecklessness or their apathy or whatever, they might have done something that was incredibly beneficent to me, incredibly beneficent to me. And they played a wonderful role in this, this dynamic that you're referring to, and it feels effortless. It feels effortless. And suddenly my, my sense of resentment melts away because I think, wow, that person was a wonderful, wonderful um, connector in some way to, to something else that has proven tremendously beneficent and helpful to me. Happens all the time. Woohoo! Yeah. From there, you, 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 you use the word efforting. Or effortless, actually. Let's talk about efforting. So you have a beautiful article in Medium on Medium.com talking about how Napoleon Hill's Think and Grow Rich may have actually been rather brilliant. You just oh, actually yeah. have to do the work. If people right. want to do that work, where is one step for them to take? Well, it's funny. When I encounter friends who tell me that they are at a dead end in their life or who have experienced some significant disappointment, I very often give them a copy of Think and Grow Rich with the following stipulation. You must do the exercises in this book as if your life depends upon it. If you do that, things will change. And that is my heartfelt belief. There is something very, very special in that book, Think and Grow Rich, truly. And I say this from personal experience, but it, it will not reveal itself to you unless you follow the instructions to a T. You really have to go in there and allow yourself to be pushed. And when Napoleon Hill tells you to write something down or take a step that you might be hesitant to take, like writing down a sum of money and the date by which you want to earn that sum of money, uh, if that goes against all your instincts, Throw out your instincts for the time being. This is what experimentation is. 
let your instincts go, as I was willing to let my instincts go, and I came into a deepened sense of what was possible. Uh, I return to that book all the time. And one of the things that can be very fun and productive for the individual is if you've read the book before, get a brand new copy and, and pretend, be theatrical, pretend you haven't read it before and go into it as best you can with, with the, the, the mindset of almost being an actor or an actress who's going into this for the very first time. Read every line, do everything to a T, to a T, and see what happens. I have a new book out uh, called The Power of the Mastermind, which is about forming a mastermind group, a step that, uh, which is a very deeply trusting uh, group of uh, consultants and advisors. A lot of people resist that step because we like to do things alone. You mustn't resist that step. Everything in the book is to be followed. There is a special interlinking connective tissue between everything in that book. So I'm a huge fan of that book. I, I think it has life-changing potentials for people. Uh, and and I, the article you're referring to on uh, uh, Medium is, is one in which I, I talk about my deep dedication to that book. I think it's called Why I Am a Think and Grow Rich Fanatic. Beautiful. Thank you, thank you, thank you. And I want to I wanna check out your book, The Power of the Mastermind. I know that's, that's, brand new. that's something that I, as I don't want to say far as I, wherever I am on this path, I know that for myself to take that next step, I need yes. a mastermind. We all need a mastermind. In fact, that would bring us back to Norville, something about who we surround ourselves with. Yes, yes. Norville really encourages you to surround yourself with people who bring out the best in you, not in competitive terms but who you want to model yourself after. It's profoundly important to hang around with people who don't gossip, who don't draw you into kind of shallow competition, who don't draw you into substance abuse, who, who maybe make references or are educated in ways that you really admire. It's very, very important to gravitate towards those people. Choose your company with the greatest of care. Uh, the great Italian novelist Ignazio Saloni wrote, what is basic in life is the choice of one's comrades. There's so much depth in that statement, greater than what may first appear. And Norvell really echoes that. It's so important that you don't just fall in with a crowd that brings out your laziest traits. You've got to fall in with a crowd uh, composed of people you want to emulate. Thank you, thank you, thank you. I'm going to ask last words of wisdom. Before I do that, it's you're so close to the fishbowl that I realize this is just getting an answer in its infancy. Any guess how you have shifted, begun to shift, or how this recent trip may influence your future timeline? Wow, that is a very, very, very heavy question. I know that one of the things that felt important to me uh, making this trip was that I wanted to come into contact with sources of power as they were expressed by one of the primal central civilizations of the human story up to this point. And I, I dedicated myself, I really, really dedicated myself to an intensity of prayer uh, during that trip and I believe that prayer is very mysterious insofar as I think prayer works, but it can work at very unexpected times and at very unexpected moments. And I think it's important to be persistent about it. And I was persistent. I was persistent when I was there in my entreaties to these different deities and personified forms of energy that I encountered uh, within the ancient monuments. And I think there's something to be said for an insistent and persistent appeal to higher energies. And um, we'll see how that plays out in my life. I'm only capturing a piece of what I think was meaningful when I was there, but it was meaningful. And we'll see how that plays out uh, in the future. I, I can't help but saying this, forgive me, because I see, I see like Young, the dream world is the waking world, the waking world is the dream world, and everything has a symbolism to it. So you're talking yes. about prayer and seeing how things will play out. I'm hearing a phone ringing. Isn't that is funny? Like yeah. the answer Sorry is, about that. No, no worries. The answer is calling. The answer <laughs> is calling you. 
I love it. That's beautifully put, Michael. The answer is falling while we're talking. Yeah, cool, cool. Excellent. <laughs> Any last words of wisdom you want to share today, Mitch? Um, my, my words of wisdom are this. Um, I was referencing this in my comment before. Be persistent. Be persistent. Um, you know, we're told knock and the door will open. We're not told how many times you have to knock. Keep knocking. I believe very, very deeply in persistence. In fact, what is persistence really but a form of faith? And if you have trouble with the term faith, as I sometimes do, just substitute the term persistence or perseverance. You know, you may say a certain prayer a hundred times and nothing happens. You may say it a hundred and one times and something absolutely extraordinary happens. Be persistent in your prayers, in your wishes, in your affirmations, in your visualizations. Never give up. Persist. It's a, it's a form of faith. It may be faith. Yeah. Say, say that last minute. It may be faith. It, it may be faith itself. It may be faith itself. Who's to say faith is not just another term for persistence? I love yeah. it. Keep on going. Yes. Amen. Amen. Thank you so much, Mitch. This has Thank been you. brilliant. We're going to have to have you back. I've taken a note to have you back on. Um, I, I have a lot of exercises I do with people on your future self, having your future self write you and guide you on your path. So I can't wait to talk about you. this. Likewise. I can't wait. Thank you, man. Thank All you right. so much. So for everyone out there, this is Michael Sandler saying, be well, have fun, get the Miracle Club, and begin awakening your slumbering giant from within by being persistent today and shine bright. Woohoo! Right. Thank you so, so much. Pleasure. Pleasure. Thanks, man. So more soon. I'll, I'll come back anytime. We'll talk uh, about nonlinearity. I, I am looking forward to it. We'll have to do it. My guess is a month or two out, but maybe sooner. Sure. Uh, there is Absolutely. no time. <laughs> right, exactly. Thanks so much for watching. If you enjoyed it, be sure to like, like below. Also, leave your comments. Have some real fun with it. Subscribe to our channel where you're going to get more great videos, more interviews coming up. And check out our website, inspirenationshow.com. That's where you'll find tips, blogs, information, videos you won't find anywhere else, and useful and helpful resources to really help you kickstart your life and to shine bright. Thanks so much again. Thank you for your support. Like, 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 comment, subscribe. See the website. Thanks so much and have fun. Of course, shine bright. Woohoo! <laughs>